Hi, my name is Liam Takura Kanenga, aka Mkokelu Wabandu. And today I'll tell you three things. One, what do we need to do to include young people in the fight against corruption? And secondly, what can we do to build ourselves as better leaders in anticipation of the fight against corruption? And thirdly, what are the best mechanisms can we put forward in order to deal with corruption? So first things first, you need to create platforms. In fact, we need to create platforms that allow young people to participate freely without fear or favor. And these are platforms that shouldn't be distant from their concrete and lived material context. For example, um, let's engage young people in spaces they already exist in. You'll find that when we try to look at young people in the working sector, most of them are found in the informal sector. You find them as storekeepers, bus touts, uh, mini bus drivers. You find them as uh, street vendors. Engage them in those spaces. And when we engage them in those spaces, you get to hear their genuine voices that are shaped by the realities they see on a day-to-day -day basis. Then what can we do to build ourselves as better leaders in anticipation of the fight against corruption? I think first things first, we need to read. Yeah, self developing self intellectual capital on an individual basis. Read. We need to engage in more conversations such that we cross pollinate ideas and learn from others. Then the second thing is we should also learn how to follow those that are leading the current crop of anti of the fight against corruption and also get to generate consensus amongst young people. So at the end of the day, we need to also build a network of anti corruption champions or of integrity champions. And within building a network, you create a movement. And when you create a movement, you create more power. Because leadership in, in and of itself is manifesting power. So when you create more power, that means you've also built enough capacity to fight corruption. Then on the last one, the best mechanisms that we can set forward to deal with corruption, that's one, um, we need to start to institute lifestyle audits. We need to ensure that People that accumulate wealth and property are accountable to society as to how they did it. It should be clear and there should be a traceable and decent source that contributes to an accumulating wealth. And at the end of the day, we also need to ensure that whenever we prosecute and arrest corrupt people, it's not just about them saving jail sentences, but we need to we need to conduct or institute asset recovery. And when we do that, one thing we do is that we get to confiscate all the proceeds benefited or all the, the resources looted from corruption and regenerate them back or reinvest them back into the general economy such that they retributively benefit uh, the taxpayer because corruption steals from the taxpayer. Then when it comes to dealing with corruption in the private sector, I think we need to start looking beyond the corporate veil. From time to time people tend to, or governments tend to blacklist uh, companies, but companies are just Jewish persons that can be terminated and new ones can be formed. So I think what we need to do now is to start also blacklisting board members, directors, chief executive officers and board chairs of corrupt companies and such that those people are not even allowed to create new companies or to do business in our country. So at the end of the day, those are the three things that I sought to talk to you about. How best can we involve young people what can we do to develop ourselves as leaders in the anticipation of a fight against corruption? And thirdly, what mechanisms can we set forward in order to deal with corruption? Well, um, the media is key, both social, digital, print, and broadcasting media, they're key. Um, for example, social media, let's amplify voices using social media. Let's magnify cases, let's raise awareness using social media. Then print media, let's write more about these things. Um, let's publish more and let's write in a way that is easy to comprehend and simple to understand. At the same time also let's utilize grassroots access like, uh, gra like uh, media spaces that are accessed by grassroots. For example, it's time that intellectuals also use to utilize blogs and tabloids to publish some of their works because that's where it has the greatest catch among young people, you know. Let's also do vlogging. Let's get into vlogging too, and like what we're doing right now, and share the message to young people. Not just young people, but also other elderly citizens who just don't have capacity to access conventional print, digital, or broadcasting media. Because these days it's even expensive to watch TV, DSTV, to buy a decoder, to even buy the TV itself, but you can have a cell phone. So let's have those videos, let's have those vlogs, those vlogs circulating. 
let's engage on WhatsApp, let's engage on Facebook. People call Facebook the village, but I call it the center of grassroots social media engagement. That's where the people in the grassroots are mostly found, at least on Facebook. So at the end of the day, let's not denigrate Facebook. Let's share our content on that village and have engagement. That's how we build a movement. That's how we socialize an idea. That's how we conscientize a mass. So let's keep on engaging and let's amplify our voices on each and every platform we have. No matter, let's not trivialize any platform. Let's ensure that every platform is an avenue to communicate. Corruption is a face and the face is male. You know, it's, it hits hard, like saying it as a man. But, for, but truly, patriarchy as a system that allocates power in our society has been a key platform at which or on which corruption occurs because that is where the power is abused or that is where the power is misappropriated and given to the wrong people or taken by wrong means and then at the end of the day it ends up oppressing. That's the other thing that also comes, corruption oppresses. Because when you loot, uh, when you take resources that are meant to benefit vulnerable communities, already you have perpetuated their problem and that's a form of oppression. Corruption fights back. And we have seen this um, in Zimbabwean context where activists expose corruption, protest against corruption and what happens? The corrupt actors themselves use their access to power to repress activists that are opposing corruption, that are protesting against corruption. So at the end of the day, corruption is like, like when you take on the fight against corruption, it's like a boxing match. You can't accept, you can't expect to just punch the blows alone, but expect others to be punched back. But how best do we insulate ourselves from the brand of repression? That is the first thing. That is one. We need to ensure that we expose and build bigger movements such that even, you know, because one thing is power is cornered by numbers. And that's how we get to now adopt a system of shifting power processes where we build more numbers. So we need to grow the movement. And when we grow the movement, you would understand that the power to replace becomes less and less and less. And that's how even the power in fact to repress it also becomes expensive. For example, imagine when you lead a, pro a protest with 5,000 people in the street. You will need more police officers, more cars, more button sticks, you know, more guns to come and beat people. That's more water cannons and that's expensive, right? Even if you lead a protest with 5,000 retweeters on Twitter, it means more data for the, the, the corrupt uh, elites to respond to because they need to deploy their stooges paid more and that that's a cost more on them as well so in and of itself we need to build and grow the movement first things is courage to vote and on voting day go out and vote but also electoral integrity is important because it's also one thing that prevents corruption and here i'm talking about corruption in terms of rigging of elections Right? So it's important for young people to ensure that they also go and defend the vote. How do they defend the vote? Be polling agents, be observers, and ensure that you, re you, you observe the truth. When you, when you record, record truth, expose lies when they are told. When fake results are published, be the ones to expose them and show the proof. Evidence gathering should also be done. And at the same time, also journalists in the media should also ensure that they are keeping checks and balances. They are playing their overwatch role throughout this whole uh, process. So at the end of the day, those are my parting shots to young people.